Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. Hey, book lovers. It has been all audiobooks and writing lately. I've had a ton of time in the car or walking, so audiobooks have been ideal. And honestly, I could not stop listening to the book I chose, so I definitely walked a lot more than usual. Not a bad thing. (laughs) Um, I've also had a really excellent week for writing. Um, I started a new story, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm trying to write something that is set in the present and does not have magic or any fantasy aspects. Um, It's exciting to try something new, and I feel good about it so far. I really find writing to be a wonderful stress reliever, and I have been under some major stress for the last couple weeks from, like, several areas of my life. And the thing is, I feel good. I feel like I'm handling things well and that my focus is finally on taking care of myself which just makes me a better person for my family and everyone around me. I use writing in my therapy, too. My therapist gave me a wonderful book uh, with writing prompts in it very early on, and it has been life-changing in the best ways. Maybe not, like, the most comfortable ways, but definitely, you know, change and growth is uncomfortable and messy and painful at times. I will probably talk about that book in a bonus episode, which I have added called Self-Care Saturdays, um, where I'm going to be discussing mental health, self-care, and books that I have found helpful. Give it a listen if you need some inspiration or just need to know that you're not alone in whatever you're struggling with. Anyway, let's talk about audiobooks now, specifically the newest in the You series by Caroline Kepnes. So I listened to the first book, which was called You, Way back, like, when it first came out, this was long before Netflix had made a show out of it or anything like that. Andy and I listened to it on a trip and loved it. It was so good. We love her writing. We love uh, Santino Fontana, who's the who's the narrator. His performance is incredible. And it was so early on that after we listened to it, Andy actually wrote her a message on Facebook and she actually responded. You know, we just told her how great her book was and how much we loved it. But so we have been on the U train from the beginning. This book is the third in the series, and it is called You Love Me. So in this one, Joe has moved to Alaska, sans his young family. He's been paid off by his ex-wife's super rich parents to disappear. He bought the town that he has moved to a library, anonymously, of course, And now he volunteers there and falls almost immediately for his boss, Mary Kay. And she seems to feel the same. There is an immediate connection, and Joe is determined to do it right this time. He's going to be a good guy, no stalking, no obsessing, no killing this time. But Mary Kay is hot and cold, and Joe is confused until he learns the devastating truth. Mary Kay is married to a has-been D-level rock star from the 90s. And the father of her sweet, nerdy daughter, Nomi, is also a recovering heroin addict. So, Joe has a problem. He is in love and knows Mary Kay loves him, too. His old urges are strong, but he is devoted to turning over a new leaf. So how can he win the girl? And if he can, will his past finally leave him alone? Caroline Kepnes is one of the best. I absolutely love her style. I love her storytelling. I love the way her mind works. Will there be more you books? Who knows? I I hope so. Um, I know that I will be reading everything else she writes. She has definitely joined my top five favorite authors, if not my top three. It's hard to compare. There's too many variables. Anyway, You Love Me continues the wildly exciting story of Joe Goldberg and his tainted love life. And it is superb. If you love audiobooks, listen to these because Santino Fontana is incredible. His voice to me will always be Joe's. And honestly, I think Penn Badgley did a good job of mimicking it. 
They kind of blend together in my head now when I listen. It's so, so, so good. Love it. And now we're going to take a quick break. Hey, book lovers. Now, as you might have guessed, I love everything to do with words. And I've been learning German for almost a year now. Prismatext has been such a help. I can read some of the best classics with German words mixed in. I really can't think of a better way to learn German. Currently, Prismatext books are available in English as a first language. And some of the languages you can learn include Spanish, French, Italian, German, and Portuguese. Follow the link in the show notes to help support the podcast. I would really, really appreciate it. And use code BOOKSANDCATS for 30% off your order. That's all caps, books, the letter N, cats, for 30% off. Start learning today while enjoying your favorite classics with Prismatext. Welcome back, book lovers. So I wanted to talk about a short story today. It is called Harrison Bergeron. It's from the book called Welcome to the Monkey House by Kurt Vonnegut. So I love it when a short story makes such a huge, lasting impact. One of the early episodes of the podcast, I covered Stephen King's The Jaunt, and that's another one that has just stuck with me for my entire life. I will never forget the day I read it. So another life-altering short story was Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, which, as I said, is part of the collection Welcome to the Monkey House. It is the second story in the book, and honestly the one that has stuck with me the most since I read this as a sophomore. I think about it often, and it definitely shaped some of my approach to writing. I love me some Vonnegut. Is every story in the book as good? No. I think it's about personal taste. There's a handful of great ones, a couple of duds, and some good ones, like I've discussed before about short story collections. So warning, if you have not read this story, there are going to be some spoilers, so skip ahead as needed. But read it anyway, because Vonnegut rules. Okay, so Harrison Bergeron was written in 1961, which was 60 years ago. But it is set in 2081, so we're only 60 years away. Which is kind of weird. When I started making notes for this episode, I was like, oh, we are right in the middle. 60 years from when it was written, 60 years until it's the time of the story. Anyway, in 2081, everyone is equal in every possible way. If you are beautiful or talented or in any way superior, you have to wear a handicap, the severity of which is varied depending on your level of weirdness. The most common handicap for intelligence is an earpiece, which emits noise every so often that distracts the person from thinking too much. In the story, Harrison's parents, Hazel and George, are watching a television show with ballerinas, who are not really any better than anyone else or more beautiful. The lead ballerina carries many handicaps because she is obviously very strong and beautiful underneath them. But George and Hazel can't think about it for too long at a time. George has the earpiece handicap, and Hazel just isn't that bright. Their son Harrison is a 14-year-old and a genius, a specimen of strength and handsomeness. He is heavily handicapped, more so than anyone else, but the United States Handicapper General cannot find a way to make Harrison equal to the others. They arrested him earlier in the day, but Hazel and George can't think about it for long, or remember what happened at all. The ballet performance is then interrupted by a news bulletin. Harrison Bergeron has broken out of jail and is on the loose. Soon after, he appears in the studio with the dancers. He unhandicaps himself and the lead ballerina, declares himself the emperor, and they dance. Their strength and beauty and grace are on full display. They break the laws of gravity and reach the ceiling, and in that moment, the handicapper general comes in and shoots them down. Hazel is crying when George comes back from getting a beer, but she can't remember what it was about now. I absolutely love this story. It's simple but beautifully written. It's dark. It's short without a lot of superfluous descriptions, and the description he does give is excellent. It's mostly focused on the handicaps, which I found really interesting. I highly recommend this and every other story, or at least most of them, in the book Welcome to the Monkey House definitely check it out. So as far as my cats, they haven't really been up to too much this week. Uh, so I don't really have any new cat stories. They're just kind of doing their thing. 
we did find some brown sort of papery crafting string, I guess. And it's apparently the most fun thing my cats have ever seen. There have been daily morning and evening play sessions with it all week. And my living room is covered in tiny shredded pieces of brown paper. Fun stuff. But they're having a great time and so are the kids. So worth it. So for this week's quote of the week, I actually managed to pick just one quote. I thought it was really fitting for this episode, and it's a Kurt Vonnegut quote. I want to stay as close to the edge as I can without going over. Out on the edge, you see all kinds of things you can't see from the center. So that is the end of this episode. Stick around after the music if you want to hear chapter 19 of my writing project, Heart of the Storm. Uh, Check out Self Care Saturdays for more nonfiction, self-helpy kind of books. And Storytime with M is on Sundays each week with a new chapter of my book Feelers. If you'd like to support the podcast, please leave a review. Five-star rating would be great. Anywhere that you listen, Apple, Spotify, wherever, it really, really helps a lot. And if you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can check out booksandcats.com. That's books, the letter N, cats.com. For all of the episodes of all three shows plus merch and books and all kinds of fun stuff. Thank you so much for listening and until next time, keep reading. Thanks for sticking around, book lovers. And now here's chapter 19 of Heart of the Storm. Mina tapped her abnormally long and skeletal fingers against the soft cashmere sweater she'd chosen in the warehouse size closet. The blonde girl was called Velen, and she grinned widely as she showed Mina the rows upon rows of clothes. Some were ancient and smelled of mothballs, which apparently hadn't worked. The older garments were shredded with moth holes. Velen and Vic returned from their inspection of the library. Vic was the one with the scarred cheek. Mina wondered what had caused it, but Vic went pale and trembled for hours the one time she asked. We found this, Velen said as she tossed the purplish, gelatinous mass to Mina's feet. Smells fresh. Mina wrinkled her nose. She wanted to be disgusted. She wanted to kick it away, but she scooped it up instead. The smell was making her mouth water, and she cried silently because she knew what she held in her deathly thin hands. She needed this. Her energy was fading, and her sister's soul would be enough to keep her going for decades. And Lottie would want to help her. Of course Lottie's soul was purple and soft. The woman had been gentle and kind in the early days, before Mina found the book in the library, before they made the wrong choice sacrificed the wrong sister. Lottie had held out the longest. She was content to age, to wrinkle and turn gray. She was lucky to wear it well, and she never did shed the silver hair, even after Mina convinced her to help them. Mina felt the tears burning her cheeks. She thought it was unfair that she was beyond life and yet still had the ability to cry. Not even death could end her grief. She gripped the slippery form in her hands and shaped it, slowly turning it in her bony fingers until it was a dense ball of swirling violet light. Mina held it up and gazed into the soft purple light. Without shifting her gaze, she saw Velen move toward the edge of the large broken window that looked out over the valley. Thick black clouds carpeted the land and blocked out everything else. There really was no other choice. Mina had doomed herself long ago. She would need all the energy she could for what came next. She sighed and popped the glowing ball in her mouth. After a couple tries, she got it down, and she was filled with light from the inside. Her pale purple glow cast long shadows around the gloomy room. Velen's angular face appeared, a vague apparition in front of her. Something's happening, she said hoarsely. The sound of a low, booming drum echoed around the valley, slowly at first, 
but the pace was building. Mina crossed to the window and gazed intensely at the cloud-covered valley. Vic elbowed Velen, and they exchanged a concerned glance. Velen cleared her throat. Um, she began hoarsely. What do we do now? Mina didn't reply. A small smile spread across her thin, tight lips. She had just spotted what she was looking for. The faintest glow amongst the clouds. She turned to the towering bones dressed in the latest clothes and shook her head slowly. There was nothing to do now, but wait. Kevo lay encased in a hammock that felt soft and light, like he was actually laying amongst the clouds. He wished he was. Floating through the sky, untouchable, seemed like an ideal place to be. He had failed everyone he had ever loved. He'd failed in the worst possible way. He rolled over and squeezed his eyes shut. The hammock swung with his abrupt movement until a hand steadied it. Hey, man. Lazalt's face. The silver-haired young man who had saved his life and then pushed him off a cliff. Kevo groaned and waved a hand at him. Go away, he grumbled. Can't do it, man, Lazalt said kindly. You've got to get up. I've got something to show you. Kevo grumbled some more, but he clambered out of the hammock. Lazalt had immediately swooped down, throwing off his cloak and revealing black iridescent wings. He pushed Kevo off the cliff and then immediately saved him. It was a strange way of building trust, but it worked. Kevo liked Lazalt. The strange young man with the wings was unlike anyone he'd ever seen, as if a mythical creature had come to life. He followed the slight glowing form through the trees. His eyes had grown more accustomed to the murky light of the forest, but there were still a lot of shadows that sent a chill through him. Lazal insisted that they were safe, but Kevo couldn't shake the feeling of dozens of eyes watching him from the shadows. Where are we going? he asked. He puffed along trying to keep up with his swift-footed companion. Slow down, man, he panted. Lazalt spun around with a devilish grin on his face. In a flash, he circled Kevo and lifted him into the air. They moved with breathtaking swiftness through the sparkling tree trunks. Kevo's heart raced, but he tried to just trust and let Lazalt take care of him. It was a strange feeling. Harper paused on the trail. She was exhausted and really couldn't move another step. She held her arms tight against her sides, careful to avoid touching the trees. She dropped to her knees and brought her forehead to the ground. The cool, packed dirt felt soothing against her sweaty brow. What's up? Gemma's concerned face hovered over her. She looked ghoulish in the strange light of the forest. It made Harper nauseous to look at her. I'm so tired, she whispered. The exhaustion was so heavy. Harper felt a weight crushing her, forcing her to the ground, spreading her on the path like a puddle. Oh boy, Gemma murmured. She knelt and checked Harper's forehead. She was burning to the touch and bathed in sweat. She stood up with panic hammering in her heart. Hey, she called out into the murky darkness. Hey, lady? Nothing. Gemma felt a cramp of fear in her belly. She had been told the forest was safe, but now she wasn't so certain. The leaves rustled high overhead and Gemma whirled around, trying to see into the darkness. There was a bright flash and the grim woman swooped down on them. She wrapped an arm around each of the girls and shot off into the darkness. Harper groaned. She was slipping in and out of consciousness. Gemma was trying to breathe. The speed of their flight had stolen her breath and she struggled to get it back. The woman did not acknowledge her burden. She flew fast and straight for the meeting place. She had her mission, and she would obey. And that is the end of chapter 19. I hope you're still enjoying Heart of the Storm. Make sure to check out my other story, Feelers, on Sunday on Storytime with M. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep reading.